All right, guys, welcome to the Social Work Race. Again, I appreciate that you listen. I pre- I've appreciated in particular the feedback from this platform, for this platform where we are having honest conversations about what it is to be on the front line, particularly as social workers. Social workers, I, I tell you what, um, the more I look into the whole issue of being a social worker, and wages and then the cost of living and poverty and then the stresses it's it's a lot of negative and i'm really here to promote social work so this 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 uh platform is really about being educated and sharing personal narratives and it's a bleak world out there for social workers and i'm sitting here thinking i love this job but but you know what i mean um so really i'm going to look for everything i can to do to try and trigger some kind of change in, in from you know from whatever level I need to go to whether it be government or just local to trigger change through discussion narratives and ideas solutions because it's not easy out here uh, as a social worker but you can learn to love this job and that's why I want a lot more voices out there pushing and promoting some of the yeah let's look at the problems but let's look at how to solve them do you know what I mean <clears throat> excuse me so yeah today I wanted to look at something quite it's dilemma based. It's a real dilemma because, you know, um, there's a few websites I, I kind of follow and uh, I'm on TikTok as well. I don't do much on TikTok. I'm trying to get into it. If you want to help me, let me know. Um, TikTok is, is a full time job, to be honest. Um, but yeah, you know, I've heard um, a few. Uh, one of my colleagues or ex colleagues has kind of triggered me to kind of she should start looking up on, you know, social um, social services on, on TikTok because it's an interesting place to get people's perspectives. And you get a lot of videos of people really putting out a lot of hate for social workers. Social workers are instantly hated out here. We are instantly hated and, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to fight that, you know what I mean? I'm going to fight that. And so what I want to do is I want to throw some intro, uh, so, something at you, a couple of stats and interesting perspectives on, on, a, on a study. And then I'm going to give you a scenario. Then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. So welcome. Get ready. Uh, put your seatbelt on because it's quite tough. Um, you'll, you'll get comments though. Um, they're taking away control from the parents. The system is corrupt. Yeah, okay, so this is the thing. Firstly, um, the law actually doesn't allow us to just take control from parents. Actually, it's the opposite. He actually doesn't allow, I mean, if I have suspicions that a child is not being looked after particularly well, and that's a very broad statement, particularly well, quote unquote, particularly well, we can't just take a child. Um, We're not trying to take control away. We're trying to make parents more accountable or to make them safe but you won't see that. And the media does not help, you know, uh, but it doesn't work like that. The law doesn't allow us to, a lot of the work that we do with, with families is actually voluntary. I think, in, if in my opinion, the, the vast majority of work that social workers do does with families is voluntary. It means that the parents will consent. They, we have to ask permission. That's how, it's, that's, that's how it works, really. Um, even when we can see clear problems that we think are gonna have really bad outcomes, we still will have to have a level of consent and compliance with the family or parents and the young person. That's how it is. Even with adults as well, we need cooperation. It doesn't work otherwise. Unless we think there's a threat to life, then we would jump in. But I can see how some people would say that we're taking control, you know. For example, growing up, I come from a West Indian community. It's not just a West Indian community that would have this. It's a wide range of communities. In fact, if you're even coming from a certain era, smacking is a thing, right? It's not discussing, I'm not really here to discuss whether it's good or bad, but what we do know is that um, when it comes to smacking in this age, it's sometimes an indicator of other issues. And some people can think, well, if I'm not supposed to discipline my child, then you're taking control from me. Now I'm afraid to manage my child's bad behavior. Well, actually, we need to look at it a bit broader because we see a correlation between that and abuse. Serious mistreatment and abuse. So I, I get it. The other thing that we sometimes get is that um, there's a level of conspiracy uh, high up. And I will say to that, so what? Maybe there is. Um, I'm going to give you a scenario 
that, you know, I, I watched a video this morning of a dad who was complaining that social services have taken his kids away and they're not allowing him to see his kids. They're not telling where the address is. And, and the thing is, he's out there and, he, and the people are commenting saying, you know, this and that about social services, how we look at them and they're evil and they're corrupted. And I'm like, you don't even know what happened. He hasn't told us what happened. Um, I've had cases where I cannot disclose where a family lives from their, the father because of DV or concerns around their safety, their emotional health of the children. There's always a backstory. And I really would like um, parents who don't understand the system to hear this. There's always a backstory. And I've done previous podcasts on this topic as well. Please listen to them, yeah? Uh, and again, and you'll see a lot of videos on this, social workers do not remove children. The courts do, okay? We may make a suggestion that it's not safe or we may call the police when it's really unsafe, but, you know, it's the last resort. And there's always a backstory. When a mum says, oh, they took my child away, they took my child away, I'm like, look, there's a backstory. We take children, we children, I say we, children are taken away from their families because of serious, serious concerns. That's how it works. So I was looking at some statistics. Uh, it looks like in 2020, 36 children were killed by mistreatment and neglect. That's, that's about three a month. Three children a month are taken away. Uh, sorry, are killed because of mistreatment and neglect. And do social workers, myself in my role, yes, I work with children and families. Do I see mistreatment and neglect? Yes, I do. Can I just take the children away based on, you know, some level of maybe it was a smack? Uh, no, I can't. It doesn't work like that. <clears throat> maybe the odd case, but generally... I can guarantee you it doesn't work like that. Now, interestingly, and this is where it gets really complex, and then I'm going to throw a scenario at you. I looked at a study in 2011 by Thames Valley. This is in the UK, in the Thames Valley. Um, <clears throat> if you want the link, uh, visit the social work race at gmail.com and I'll just send you the info. Um, interesting. They look. Well, I, I wanted to specifically look at the main predictors for child death, domestic violence, uh, death by dom domestic violence and, and uh, neglect and tr maltreatment, okay? This study went into it. So when I say the main predictors, meaning what can we see as a main correlator for child death, okay? In the same way, just watched a really good video. It was on Joe Rogan's uh, podcast. This uh, um, scientist was on there and he was saying that the biggest predictor by miles above everything else for what uh, for predicting if sexual abuse will take place, that's in paedophilic, meaning parent to child, okay, within the family, because we know 80% of abuse takes place in the family. What's the biggest predictor of child abuse? And by a, a country, 100 miles, it's a step parent. Yeah? So what we're saying is, is that we're not saying that if you're a step parent, you're going to abuse. We're saying that's the biggest predictor because that's the feature that shows up more than anything. OK, so what I'm saying is, is that I'm looking at the predictor for for uh, domestic violence and child death. And I'm doing this for a reason to help you understand how complex this is. The study found that half, uh, sorry, in, yeah, the study shows that half of domestic violence incidents had uh, the the, the uh, perpetrators of domestic violence, they have no prior conviction with the police, okay? Five out of 118 cases reviewed were deemed high risk after the investigation, which is a 99% false positive. So a lot of allegations coming through the system, but when we investigate it, there's no basis of it. It could be like someone's conflating or trying to get someone in trouble, being malicious, that's happening. So there's a small minority of, and it's only, you know, say only, it's 36 children out of all the, the millions of children we have in this country, a handful will die, okay? And it's like 36. So we're looking at all those children that have died. The only thing that we, we can't really see, we can't really see when it's gonna happen. We could just have indicators. And those indicators, we try to work with the family on. 
Okay. So in England, we've, we have a study that shows that, you know, the vast majority, 99% of the allegations made are actually false. Um, and then when we see the indicators, sometimes you'll hear a child's been smacked or you not being fed or, you know, the parents have lost control. What's going on in the background? Though? And one of the things that's in my head, especially in my last role in my previous job, because I just started a new one recently, was am I going to miss this kid? Because this kid's showing signs of X, Y, and Z. Are they going to die under my watch? So we see these indicators and we think, well, let's run in and take the kids, but then the public get upset when we do. And then if we remove these kids and we find that the vast majority of cases, it's actually not a true allegation, we're destroying families. You know, let me give an example. This is no one specific. This is just me. I made this up, but it's real. To the point of you can bet there's someone out there like this. Mother of three, say she has a 13, 8 and 5 year old. The oldest is 13. The parent has a history of social care for herself and her children in the past. All the children have behavioural challenges in their school. School are well aware of how they are and what's going on and they can see it. Um, the parent, the mother feels that she's doing a really good job or doing her best. Okay. Um, she does smoke and drink in front of them. She, she, that was a door slamming. She does smoke and drink in front of them. The home is chaotic. According to us, what do we see? We see a lot of mess. We don't see proper hygiene. As, whose standard are we using? We have to use a standard. So, you know, we consider it chaos. Um, you know, um, dishes are not clean and, you know, doors are broken. There's holes in the wall. Cupboards are broken off. The kitchen's a mess, you know. Four men have been through the home, through the family, meaning that she's had, you know, four men, including the children's fathers and boyfriends, okay? The eldest girl is 13, is smoking and drinking, going out late, 13 years old, she should not be going out. Um, the mum, we don't think she's responded effectively. So what do we do? We help, we support. What can we do for you? Do we go in, go in and take this child, you know what I mean? Uh, do, do, do you see the scenario? Um, one current boyfriend, he doesn't seem to be playing an effective role. Um, but one question you'll have to ask is, why is a man there with a woman with three children? Um, he's moved in, what's that about? And with the knowledge that, you know, this is uh, one of the predictors of abuse, you know, what do you do about that as a social worker? Um, both parents smoke cannabis, but not in front of the children. But there's no way you can hide that because it smells, right? And kids, all kids, from like from the time you're 10 years old, you know what cannabis smells like. That's just the way it is now. Um, neither parent seems to have any control over the children's behaviour. They don't have the skills to manage their behaviour. And obviously with behaviour, it gets worse. It doesn't just stay constant. It either gets better or it gets worse. Marks are seen on both, ch on two of the younger children their bodies. Sorry, the two of the older children. Parents deny any knowledge of how it happened. Children are not saying where the marks came from. What do you do about that? Um, both parents blame the school and blame neighbours for, you know, how they're treating their kids. And the question is, at some point, we have to do something. And the question is, what do we do? Because the trajectory of behavior and the impact of the environment. You can see it set these children on a trajectory that they will most likely be worse off later in life. How do we change that? Do we whip them out of their home? Create um, a detach, um, attachment tra uh, detachment trauma? Or do we work with the family who's really not getting it? What do you do? and the trauma of being ripped out of your family, even if they're no good for you, can be just as damaging, if not worse, than leaving them in the home. So my question is, and I don't intend to provide answers in this, it's just a reflective session to say, what do we do? This is two parents, this is two people in, in, in general society. If you have any suggestions, let us know. But we, I just want you to know, we cannot change people. We can only provide avenues for them to change. We can give them tools, but you cannot make people change. 
that's what social that's one of the, the frustrations in social work and so when children are eventually removed it's because we've been working with the family long enough to say we need to change this but it's not working we're going to have to take your kids away parents crying on social media they took my kids away uh <laughs> Even in this situation that I've just read out to you, this scenario, um, we wouldn't remove a child unless there were maybe the, the child disclosed that maybe the dad had sexually abused her. And we would then say to the parent, either give up your boyfriend, he means that he cannot come to the house in the interim of this investigation, or we will remove the child. And you'll be surprised that some parents will choose the boyfriend or the partner. It happens. It's deep. Anyway, this is Food for Thought. What do we do? That's a dilemma. Does it require an answer or have I answered it? If you want to get involved in this podcast, just let me know. Uh, visit my LinkedIn page, The Social Work Race, or email me at thesocialworkrace at gmail.com. Take care of yourselves, guys.